question. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. This is our um, first of the events in the Conversations on DEI and Scientific Events series. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge all the organizers. Um, all of us are in NCAR, but we're having speakers from all over. So we're really excited to start this and for you all to join. So a little bit of background about this event, why it was created, what the goals are. Um, really the event started because uh, some of us noticed that there's a lot of talk about, you know, increasing DEI and making scientific events more inclusive, but um, maybe not practiced as much as it should be. And so from that, we thought, okay, well, we'd really like to learn more about this and, and maybe talk to other geoscientists about you know, this issue of creating science, you know, inclusive scientific events. And so we found this wonderful guide um, that is from 2019 on creating its inclusive scientific meetings. It's a whole guide on where to start and how you do that. Um, and there's a lot of really great authors, including many who are on the call today. So thank you for joining and creating this awesome guide. Um, but when we were reading through this guide, we wanted to share some of the things that, you know, were in this because we felt like, okay, well, we just found out about this guide. It'd be great if we could start to have conversations with other people in geoscience about how do we actually implement some of these practices, um, which I should note, they are updating this guide now um, because to update it to 2021 standards. So anyway, this is really the basis, the motivation um, for why we're doing this series. And um, whoops. Um, so we're going to be going through different aspects of this guide, as well as some additional uh, information. So just ground rules for today. Um, if you could please mute yourselves during the presentation, that would be fantastic. Um, be kind, be respectful, listen to other people's perspectives. When we're talking about some of these issues, you know, it's really important to be mindful of different perspectives than your own. So um, just being respectful is, is really great. Um, and so the format today, we're going to have presentations by Dr. Deb Morrison and Dr. Heidi Steltzer, who have uh, graciously agreed to share their knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, and after their presentation, we will have breakout discussion rooms where we have some guided questions uh, for you all. And then the remaining time, we'll address some questions. Um, so if you check the chat, there should be a link to Slido. So Throughout the entire you know, um, hour we have here, if you have a question, feel free to submit that to Slido. And then at the very end, we'll start to address some of those questions. Um, and yeah, so we can jump into things now. And um, so yeah, Dr. Dem Morrison, Dr. Heidi Steltzer will be presenting today. And they're going to talk about diverse ideas and values lead to innovation and in science and for our world. And this is based on um, a recent paper that they published, which hopefully you all have read, has some really great nuggets of information. And so uh, without further ado, I will let um, both Heidi and um, Deb introduce themselves, and then I will start their presentation. So Deb, Heidi, whoever wants to introduce themselves first, go for it. Thank you. I'll start us off. Um, we have created the slide set in a way that you can view it and share it um, and do encourage you to do that. There are lots of resources in the slide deck that will help you, um, different references to research um, and links to our own professional sites, things like that. So please feel free. Um, and more about us specifically, I think you can find at each of our professional websites, but maybe just a, a brief vignette of like, how did we come to work together? <laughs> because I think that's kind of interesting. Um, so I'm Deb Morrison. I work at the Institute of Science and Math Education at the University of Washington. Um, and quite a few years now ago, four, four years ago, I think, um, we started a collaboration among uh, many different folks, 500 Women Scientists, the Inclusive Science Meeting Guide that um, Aaron was just mentioning, uh, Earth Science Women's Network, um, Aspen Global Change Institute, and we all met in Boulder um, in, at NCAR. And we discussed and worked and talked through um, what would it be to increase diversity at scientific meetings? And that was kind of how the, the conversation started. And from that, there's been many different kind of spin-off collaborations. Um, and one of them is work that Heidi and I have done um, across the time and just thinking about like, what is it as, 
as we start to unfold different aspects of our scientific work that we can actually infuse knowledge about equity, diversity, inclusion, and more broadly issues of justice. Um, and so that's kind of how we came to work together. And I think Heidi and I will probably work together 30 years from now. <laughs> so, so, so maybe Heidi, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? And go yeah, ahead and, and throw up the slides whenever you're ready. Yep. I'll just briefly note. So my name is Heidi Stelzer. Uh, I know several of you, and for many, it's a new introduction. So I'm excited to make this first connection and see where the connections go from here. I am a faculty at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. So about eight hours from where NCAR is. And it is a public institution in our state that has a Native American serving mission. And so um, some of the motivation for the work with Deb and certainly for being part of the forum today and the, the working group on inclusion is uh, that I feel a responsibility in teaching students of color um, to create a space um, for their ideas and um, their whole person to be valued um, in the community of science. Uh, I'm trained as a biogeochemist and I'm part of the Department of Environment and Sustainability here at Fort Lewis. So with that, we'll go to the slides and I'll let Deb take it away. Thank you. Um, I forgot about that. We bonded over biogeochemistry. So my background is in biogeochemistry as well. Um, and in, for the last 20 years, I've been thinking about learning design. So the other um, logo that you'll see on here is Clear Environmental. So I have a nonprofit um, that works around climate learning for empowerment, action and resilience um, that is also in play in this work. All right, if we can go ahead. So we do want to do an indigenous acknowledgement um, at the beginning of this conversation. And we're gonna do it a little bit differently than a land acknowledgement as we're in so many different locations. Um, as you start to think and work in your own space, if you wanna acknowledge in the chat where you're specifically located, that'd be terrific. Um, I'm coming in today from Wasainich lands um, in Steas, which is Pender Island, British Columbia. Um, and on this um, image, we have an image of North America, but it, there's actually much more information around the world. Um, and this site is nativeland.ca, which is in the notes section for the slide. Um, and you can find out more uh, about where you are located rel relative to Indigenous lands um, and understanding of what that acknowledge may mean in your place. Um, so please go ahead and do that. Um, we also have provided a link to a number of resources that continue to grow and thinking about how we come to understand and know around indigenous knowledge and science. Um, and this is really, the, these resources are very diverse. They're developed by the Institute, um, or they're collected by the Institute to help foster science teaching efforts. Um, but they are awesome for just learning. Heidi, do you wanna say anything else there? Okay, we'll go ahead. All right, so we're gonna tell a couple brief stories to kind of ground us in what we're doing and, um, and what it means um, to sort of dig into the paper. So we're gonna pick two stories that are not in the paper because we actually think that um, you've probably read the paper and if you haven't, you can. So we'll come back to that at the end. So the first one is about the Arctic. Um, and it's really an interesting story of how Arctic peoples, so Inuit, Sami peoples in the Arctic, have um, come to be able to be heard in new ways in relation to global climate science. And so a lot of work has gone on over millennia in the Arctic, documenting, transmitting, carefully sharing through knowledge holders, um, wisdom about the changing of the Arctic sea ice, of the community, of the ecology, that knowledge is fundamental to the culture and their survival uh, and the livelihood of Arctic peoples. And so what happened is as Arctic scientists trained in more Eurocentric sort of systems of science, moved into the Arctic starting to document global climate change, um, we had a really interesting cultural clash that started happening to some degree. And, and it, was almost a, it, it was almost more of an erasure as opposed to a clash because the Inuit worked with the Arctic explorers to move and like map the Arctic and do all sorts of things, um, but were never really necessarily asked what their own knowledge was. 
And so um, as that sort of movement happened, many scientists working in the area developed good relationships with Inuit and Sami peoples and then started understanding, wow, there's this incredible knowledge that we're not seeing because we see science in a particular way and we're not expanding how we understand science to be documented um, and science to be um, collected. And it's just a different way of science. And so we need to explore that more deeply. So um, some of the earliest people to document that connection in the Arctic region were folks like Elizabeth Weatherhead um, and Gearhead and uh, Barry, and I've included their papers in the notes section. So where they actually took ethnographic and uh, anthropological approaches to being able to document, document Inuit knowledge. Um, and while this has been done for decades and decades in different ways, it was one of the first times that it actually connected it specifically with Eurocentric science understandings and knowledge systems. And that was really critical because it shifted the power dynamic that was given weight to Inuit and knowledge systems while they should have had a, you know, power globally for a long time. They were erased or diminished prior to that. And so it opened up an incredible amount of research that started proliferating on trying to figure out how to document research around knowledge systems in indigenous spaces. There has also been extensive work done this, on them, this in Australia as well, um, and New Zealand. Um, so I've included a number of papers that start to kind of follow some of these pathways in the Arctic work as an example of how we are not trying to include indigenous knowledge in, science, in other traditions of science knowledge, but instead how we weave them together. One is not dominating the other. They are sitting side by side in ways that can inform our futures, our shared futures. And I'll pause there and see, Heidi, if you wanna add anything to that. Um, I love what you've shared, Deb. And I think the one thing that comes to mind um, is absolutely that integration and that weaving and that um, be prepared to be surprised um, by language and where and how in different cultures we use language differently, but we may not mean wildly different things. And uh, the stories, the narratives build in ways that I think are, are far more impactful um, when I hear and I see the language weaving together. Um, and so that may be that, um, that we tend to um, take values out um, through training in your uh, Eurocentric training and indigenous colleagues um, may bring the values in and that may create new spaces for us to integrate our values into why we're motivated to do the science that we're doing and what we see in ways that are um, in some cases beyond what we can directly measure. Um, and for a group that's studying what NCAR folks study, um, you can think of all the things that you've measured in your career. And you can all think of all the things that you've had a really strong sense were important parts of the system and yet you couldn't directly measure them. Um, but we can still have language to talk about them. And I see that that's a strength um, of what I'm learning by working with more indigenous scientists. And thanks for bringing that up too. So one of the things that we're starting to see in under, and, and even in the practices of documenting the knowledge in new ways, because the knowledge was documented before, it was just done in different ways. Um, so oral traditions are not stories. They're not folklore. They are in, in the form and practice that they were in the Arctic or in other indigenous communities. It's, they are carefully transmitted knowledge um, that's done, and it's not usually done with everyone in the community. It's often done with knowledge keepers who are like experts in the space of being able to transmit rigorous knowledge systems from one generation to the next. And so like really thinking about um, how we understand that work as being different from the word story in English, because the word story in English doesn't encompass the type of oral tradition and knowledge collection that we're necessarily seeing, we have an open mic, um, that we're necessarily seeing in, um, in, in what is indigenous science transmission, knowledge transmission. Um, and also the idea of values being integral. So 
um, we actually, and many philosophers in science across multiple cultural traditions have questioned the idea of valueless or neutral science, that that is just not a reality. Um, Sandra Harding is probably the most famous among them of like standpoint theory and saying that we always are positioned as we engage in our scientific work and thus our humanity and our human cultural values are always in play and influencing what we're doing. And so um, that is true regardless of the culture you're coming from. It's not only indigenous science that holds values. So interrogating that and coming up against a system that has different values is actually such a growth area for all of us. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead to the next one. Thank you. Um, this example is from the Pacific Northwest um, in the sort of general region across the Salish Sea where I live. Um, this is specifically the Swinomish um, Indian tribal community. I think it's, yeah, oh, I have it there on the slide. Look at that, um, how they like to be referenced. And this is an example that we pulled in to work in Washington state in learning science um, across all different uh, grade bands and into higher ed, um, largely because the work of the, of the Swinomish is just unbelievably rigorous and interwoven with all different forms of science. They've been teaching something called the Between Two Worlds curriculum in their high school, um, where they're actually helping young indigenous people and others who are non-indigenous in their communities learn all different traditions of science as they learn any science. So they're learning them all at the same time. Um, and they're starting to make sense of how to manage the differences between them and how to think about that. So they're gaining identity in being scientists, regardless of your cultural background um, and the cultural knowledge systems that you're studying and using. Um, this particular one has what Heidi was naming earlier. It has language that may seem really um, value laden to us, but seems just very base to them. So I'm going to try to bridge that to our value system and, and the language that we would use in Eurocentric um, based science. So this, they, they teach science through the 13 moons and the 13 moons are the moons of the year. So they teach science based in seasonality. And so at different times of year, there are different phenomena in the world that you look at and you understand and you think about the responsibility that you have to those different parts that you as a human are fundamentally entwined with that cycle and that you are learning it to understand the system. So fundamentally, the 13 moon uh, approach to studying science is a systems thinking approach to studying science. And it helps us incredibly when we come to, to think about anything that has to do with systems level science, because any one aspect of the ecosystem is always interconnected to the other aspects of the ecosystem. And it's situated in place, it's situated in um, shifting year to year patterns, they, they discuss that as they talk about, like, how is this different from previous years? So you can constantly see the flow of, of different years and how that might influence things. Um, a big nod to Todd Mitchell and Jamie Donatuto, um, who have been core people in the work. Um, Todd himself is a, both an Indigenous and a Eurocentric trained scientist and has really been leading a lot of this effort. Um, Jamie, there's a number of papers by Jamie, co-authored with Jamie and others, Todd included, that are referenced there if you want to read any of the papers and how they're doing this, because they're really solid examples of how not only are they doing the learning design around this, but how they're actually implementing changes in their natural resource management based on the science work that they're doing together. So really excellent examples. Um, but again, the language that we're talking about here weaves together the value system and more explicitly than I would say many Eurocentric scientists names the value system as they're teaching the science. Um, so whether you agree or disagree with the value system, at least you can see it. Um, and so that's very, very helpful for thinking about the next step, which is like, what is the management that we're going to do as, as you know, keepers of this place? Um, so I'll pause there for a sec. All right. Oh, actually, one other thing about this. This 13 moon calendar, the Swinomish have um, published several different books and resources for use with community and family or community and schools. Um, 
the community that I live in, um, the Wasanish people also use a 13 moon calendar to teach science. It's slightly different than this one because it's a slightly different place. Um, and there are multiple uh, versions of it that have been like um, created and shared with the community. We have two physical representations in my own island community that were gifted to us by the Wasanich um, so that people in the community can actually learn um, and think about it. All right. Anything else to add here? Okay, we'll go ahead. So as we talk about these examples, one of the things that becomes really apparent is that what you think of as your values um, and how you are positioned in the world is actually critical to how you think about what science is. Um, and so this image is kind of a, you know, incredible complexity of who we each are. We all have these different identities. And um, I included, there's lots of different papers um, to include on this. Actually, I'll, I'll add one more into the slide deck after we talk um, on positional theory that might be helpful for those of you who are really academic minded. But I've included one here um, that is really helpful because it comes out of physics. And I actually think that can be like the hard nut space for many people who are thinking about identity and values is to understand that in the context of something that we think of as very objective and value neutral. So um, it's a great example to look at. Myself, like when I think about my own positional markers, I'm an immigrant to the United States. Um, I'm a dual citizen between Canada and the US. I you know, have particular gender and identity and sexuality markers. I am both self-positioned and others position me as white. Um, people position me as English dominant, though I'm multilingual. Um, and so all of these nationalities and education statuses, I come from like a rural background, um, upbringing very poor when I was, you know, grew up, but relatively affluent now. And so like all of these things influence what questions I ask. So most of my scientific work was on forest ecology because I grew up in a logging and fishing village and those were things that were critical to my community. And so they're value laden. Like I wanna understand how to do healthy forest ecology because it's deeply rooted in the stability of my own community. And so that type of thinking helps us start to understand why we do the work we do and what motivates how we do the work we do. Heidi, do you want to add there? I think um, the two things that I would add is, is one that when we look at this diagram, we can think about what we might be able to see represented and then what we wouldn't be able to see represented of these different social cultural markers and positionality. And also to be very conscientious to not make any assumptions that what we may see may not actually represent um, how the person themselves identifies and that nobody um, owes us um, their story um, of how they identify and who they are. Um, and I found that that's a really important um, space for me to ground myself in all the time because I can see and tell that people don't um, know the whole me. And then I also, in working with the very, very diverse community of students, um, it's taken time. I'm now in my 13th year at Fort Lewis, um, and it's taken time for me to, to step into a space where I make fewer assumptions um, about others um, based on their phenotype and where and how someone looks. Um, and I just, I, I let the time um, and investment in a relationship um, be the opportunity and the space for, from which I get to see what they want to share with me rather than um, anything coming from an assumption that I have. Um, so those are the pieces that I'd like to add. Thanks, Deb. No, that's great. And even that idea that like asking people for their identity markers is is intrusive to some idea to some level. Like it is an offer that people put out about who they are that they do in relationship with others. And to ask people to name themselves is to force them into a box that then there might be other assumptions tied to. And many people don't wish to do that. And so 
um, and justly so. There has been a lot of oppression tied to those things. So, um, but but being aware for the things that are hidden, for the the nuances and lived experiences, is actually pretty critical. Um, and and knowing yourself, like a lot of this is just about knowing yourself and how you're positioned or how others may be positioning you. Um, because that's a real thing too. I've walked into a lot of different contexts where people are like, oh, she's like a cute little white girl, you know, like, and I'm like, okay. And I'm a scientist and I'm a, you know, a rock climber or whatever, like all the different things that we are and we do, you know, so there's a lot of, and I'm a, you know, anti-oppression activist. So, you know, owning those different parts are about how we build those relationships with each other. All right, if we can click forward. Um, to that end, we also wanted to provide you a couple of resources specifically around our paper with um, Indigenous collaborations. So here there's a couple different um, documents that if you're not aware of, you should be aware of. Um, one is UNDRIP, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and there are a couple guides that are produced by Indigenous groups around collaboration with Indigenous groups. So, and these are not the end all and be all, but they're, what I would caution you on is that if you start to use any kind of collaborative partner to help you build collaborations or collaborative resource, make sure that you know who the source of that is. So collaborative guides on any issues of equity and justice should be written at least with authorship from that group on the panel, if not owned fully by that group as they write them. So Indigenous owned documents talking about Indigenous collaborations, that's a real thing. Like you should make sure that you're, you're sourcing that. Um, the Becoming Visible one on the side is by Illuminative, and that's just really naming the issue that I talked about in the Arctic example, where we may not even see what we don't know. And so like being able to actually open your eyes to, to see the world um, in multiple ways. Um, and some of the um, central US tribes talk, talk about that is seeing with both eyes. Okay, go ahead. Um, also, as you work, I, I really did want to highlight the clear lab book here, um, and the ready agreements are helpful. In any work, like Heidi was saying, you can't make assumptions, so you need to open space. You need to open space and process in, in collaborative effort in ways that really help you um, be able to hear and see. And so ironically, that means that one person's not talking all the time, um, <laughs> but it means that we are starting to open up space to be able to carefully hear and regulate the space that different people are taking in, this, in, the, in the power structure of talk um, so that more people are being heard and that they're being heard in ways that are not like our, our you know, I was trained in a way where you're actually doing argumentation in a particular way where I'm constantly interrogating what you're saying and arguing with you. And that does work in many um, instances, but it actually can be problematic when you're crossing different cultural boundaries with people where they're just like, did you hear me? Or were you listening? Or were you just waiting to argue with me? And so like being able to just hear different things, think about them, give some time, and then come back with constructive critique can be helpful. All right. Um, the last thing that I kind of want to name before we move into our paper and some other sort of general comments is if we flip forward one, it's really important that we keep our eye on the idea that we have a shared future. So as humanity and as all life on earth, we are on a big ball flying through space and it's a finite environment. And as we start to think about this, this idea that we're in a shared home, space and time and place take on a different I understanding. And so like really starting to think about the different cultural communities as these incredible gifts and offerings that we have to share with each other. Um, and that by learning and not assuming that our way is the right way, we're starting to be able to open up incredible possibilities and innovations in our future, um, apart from the ethical arguments for just, you know, operating in more just ways. So um, I included a link at the bottom of this slide for Elon Schabe's work from the uh, ISS in Potsdam, Germany, for a piece that he wrote on um, really conceptualizing vision, identity, and collective behavior as we work towards sustainable futures. And I think it's very, very valuable to what Heidi said earlier, that as we have different value systems underlying our histories, we actually have to 
surface those and think about those together as we do shared work together. And that shared scientific work, it's shared, you know, management work in our spaces. It can be a lot of different things. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Heidi to advance and think about the next couple. I don't know if I have a way to advance. There you go, it's just next. <laughs> so. okay. I just wasn't sure whether I had any control over things. <laughs> um, so again, it's wonderful to have you all here. We're leading up to where we're gonna have a breakout and some discussion and hoping that, um, that some of the ideas come from um, that can contribute to the discussion come from this paper um, that we wrote together. Um, you'll hear a little bit from Deb and I about what motivated this paper. This is one of the um, achievements I've done in my career in science um, that I'm the most proud of. Um, there's so much packed into this tiny space. Uh, it is a citation rich couple of pages and that's with the intention to show and highlight uh, where and what the wealth of social science is between the, uh, behind these ideas of where and how we can create a space um, where more ideas um, can come together and put forward, be put forward, and we can recognize the role of values and philosophies uh, as part of how we plan for science, we create spaces for science, and what that can create for opportunity to have the conversations we all need to um, step into, some of which will be very uncomfortable for us. I have noticed more and more that, um, that the path forward um, for a better world, um, a world that's more inclusive and a world that's um, um, more aligned with our values, um, the values, for example, of uh, caring for one another, um, requires uh, that we step into spaces where we're uncomfortable and we can expect um, there's some risk. And so uh, I think the next slide is a good one to go to, which is acknowledging what those risks are. So what motivated us to write the article? What did we see and acknowledge as risk at the time that we were writing the article? And what did we learn from this experience? And so I'll let Deb go with what her perspectives are. And what I want you to see is that these aren't the same. Um, that for Deb and I, we both stepped into the space motivated in different ways, um, recognizing different risks and learning different things. And yet we were still present to do this um, cooperative research, uh, cooperative learning um, together that our motivations don't need to be the same. So Deb, go for yours. So for me, I have a very deep ethical stance on how we learn and participate and who gets to do that and whose voices are heard, whose bodies are in the room, who, those types of things. So that highly motivates me in all things, especially science. I love science and I wish we could have just such a more diverse com community in space when we're doing work. Um, related to that is that idea that I just... I love speaking with people who don't think like me, who don't have the same experiences as me because they just push my thinking so much. And so that idea of values, knowledge and practices that are different than mine is just an amazing gift that I love to have. However, risk wise, like I'm constantly feeling and I think many people do in this space as we balance between science and justice issues, I'm constantly feeling this imposter syndrome if like, do I know enough about any of these things to really talk about them? And so, um, you know, that that was an, a worry with me in writing again in a science context, because um, I've spent a lot of years writing in social science context. So I was a little worried about that. Um, but I really want I, I think in this effort, I really got a chance to just try out how to frame things across these communities that I care about and love so deeply um, and really challenge this idea of neutrality and positionality. Like how do we balance the understandings that we have around these things? Because of course we want to have the objectivity principle in play, but like, what does that really mean versus like social positioning? And so that was super fun to explore about those ideas. Thanks, Deb. And for my part, uh, there was an article, a single article that motivated this collection um, that the Ecological Society of America published. And in that article, um, there was an idea put forward that people of color don't often see themselves as scientists. And I read that and I thought, that's not what my world's been like at Fort Lewis College, um, serving, you know, I think at this point we have more than 50% students 
um, of color enrolled at Fort Lewis and 40% of that is students of uh, Native American descent. And many, most of those students see themselves as scientists. And so I was like, wait, why would somebody else's perspective be different? And where and what's the space to put forward um, what I've seen and what I've understood from engaging with this community? We were offered this opportunity to collaborate on the paper at the time, um, soon after George Floyd's death and the Black Lives Matter movements. And um, I wanted to think about what piece um, I could do to contribute to the efforts um, that um, were going on in our country um, and people putting themselves at far greater risk than any risk I took as part of um, writing and publishing this paper. And I personally have had experiences that I don't belong in science. And that's a little different than imposter syndrome. Um, that's not uh, doubting my capacities um, to be a scientist, but seeing that where and how I wanna practice science, how I approach science can be quite different from a lot of other scientists and, and directly being told that the way I'm approaching things isn't okay. Um, and I need to back off from, from what feels authentic to me. Um, and so there's a personal motivation there too. Um, given that personal motivation, the, the risks, the what ifs, the what ifs, um, when something feels personal, um, it's um, important to recognize that what may feel like a personal motivation for me may not, um, any criticisms um, that come may not be about me in any way. They may represent other people's um, viewpoints and um, where they're at and their own self-awareness more. Um, so similar to Deb here, some of the, the, the questioning if it should be me, and I put wicked criticism because we often talk about wicked problems in our world and um, the wicked criticism. Um, there's so many ways you can interpret the word wicked. I grew up in the Northeast and so wicked also meant awesome. Um, <laughs> um, growing up, things could just be wicked and that meant that they were awesome. So maybe we can see it that way too, that wicked criticism can mean um, that it will be criticism and it will be appropriate criticism and it, it can be what I can learn the most from. Um, so um, I use that word with intention um, when I chose to put that in the risk space. And uh, I learned so much by putting this article together, but what we haven't had an opportunity for is that Deb and I really wanted to um, step into a space of conversations, step into a space of conversations with you all uh, step into a conversations with anyone who wants to talk to us and engage in, in that we can listen to, to and learn from about what this inspires. And so this, um, we really appreciate NCAR for hosting this um, because this is our first foray into the conversation space um, following the publication of this article. So the next slide. And I think this is our last one before we go into the discussions and the breakouts. And that's just to check out our, uh, we've talked a lot about values as part of what we've presented. And just in case that's a new space for you, uh, I wanna highlight that um, there are many resources online. This is just one of them. This is put out by the Urban Indian Health Institute and it's a set of values cards. I, I use these regularly in um, bringing self-awareness um, to myself and um, where and what and why I'm choosing to invest in something. Um, these are examples of some of the value cards. I also have brought these into spaces where I work with others. So for example, um, midterm this semester was really tough at Fort Lewis College, um, perhaps at some other schools too across the country. Uh, it's just, it's a different space to be in education in a pandemic. And so um, I brought forward the values cards for an activity in my class so that we could all see what values were helping us um, to support us as we stepped into a, a learning space together during a pandemic. Uh, and it was a really meaningful space where we could see um, something positive um, and something personal um, as part of what we were doing um, through a challenging time of pandemic educationing. So that's a resource. And then we'll go to our discussion slides. So I think we're at the breakout. So here's our questions. And um, at this point, we wrote these questions, but we will turn it over to Erin to lead and facilitate the breakout. So she's in charge now. Thank you. Great, thank you, Deb and Heidi. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I think we all learned a lot. But I think, yeah, the value is really starting to discuss some of these ideas and these themes. So um, we are a little short on time. So I'm going to say just 10 minutes for the breakout discussions because I would like to address 
some of the questions on the Slido at the end. Um, so Jenny will be sorting everyone into uh, breakout rooms and we'll have we'll go over some of these questions um, and we will have people, the organizers and the speakers in each of those uh, breakout rooms to help guide the discussion. So Jenny, if you want to go ahead and send people to their breakout rooms, um, you'll see something pop up on your screen. So thanks.